Hey, welcome to The Buzz. On this episode, we're gonna be stepping into two different worlds. First, we're gonna join the district's wildlife ecologist and her team as they monitor state threatened ornate box turtles. Then we're gonna go on a road trip to see where our Recycle Your Bicycle donated bikes end up after they're dropped off at the preserves. From expansive prairies to the streets of Chicago, get ready for an exciting ride on this episode of The Buzz. We're in the southern part of Will County on the hunt with our wildlife ecologist as she tracks down state-threatened ornate box turtles. If you're a Buzz regular, you may remember last year we teamed up with Boykin Spaniels to track down these elusive turtles. Projects like these take a few years to locate individuals and keep records of them. So currently we have a few turtles with transmitters on that we're monitoring as the study continues. Our wildlife ecologist, Becky Blinkenship, is leading the monitoring today and will be here to teach us about these special turtles. So what can you tell us about today? Can you give us an overview? Today we will be tracking state-threatened ornate box turtles using radio telemetry equipment. Uh, we'll go out into the field, locate each of these turtles, and collect some habitat data, location data, and just general notes about what the turtle's doing and anything else that we find notable. I am so excited to be joining you. How many turtles are you monitoring? Uh, we're monitoring 15 turtles. Uh, we have seven females and eight males. We monitor these turtles twice a week so that we can see uh, their movements, how far they move. And it also kind of gives me an overall picture of where this population is, like what space does it occupy? Does that change seasonally? Um, we also collect habitat data, so what type of vegetation are they hanging out in? How tall is that vegetation? How much exposure to predators or to the sun do they have? Um, and what they're doing. So sometimes you're lucky enough to see a turtle with a berry in its mouth or its face is stained with berry juice and you could say it was foraging, which is really exciting to see. How do you initially find the individuals? I know we use the turtle dogs, but is there any other method to your madness? You just stumble upon them? The turtle dogs help a lot. Uh, they, they use their noses to find these turtles when they're moving and that helps tremendously because they're so well camouflaged and so small that using human surveyors, while it is effective after a burn, once the vegetation's up a little, it's harder. Um, so the turtles, the turtles can also like hide underground, so that makes it even more difficult for human surveyors. Uh, so the dogs are a huge benefit. But when we don't have the dogs, yeah, we can just walk through the habitat looking for turtles um, basking in the sun or moving from area to area. Uh, the most frequent way we've stumbled across turtles mm -hmm. is when they're mating with other turtles. Oh, so <laughs> sneaking up on a private moment. Yes, exactly. So we've, we found two turtles that were unmarked previously um, because they were mating and they were out in the open, so they were easy to find. And then we were also tracking one of our transmitter turtles and he was mating with a new female so we were able to collect her and put a transmitter on her so awesome yeah <laughs> we do have a number of partners that help us out with this project our biggest helpers are the Lakewood Animal Hospital because they provide us with free radiographs for all of our females each season and that gives us invaluable nesting data and reproductive data with how many eggs each turtle has it, it helps us calculate average clutch size and um, eventually we'll be able to get like nest success data. So these are my two seasonals, Rebecca and Catherine. They've been helping me all season track these turtles twice a week. Um, they have gotten to know the turtles very well and where they'll tend to be and I could not have done this project without them. So can you tell us exactly like what we're looking for, what we're listening for, what the strategy is? Sure, so we've got the frequency in the receiver and we're just following the loudest beep until we get close enough to where we're pretty sure we're close to the turtle to where we could get a visual. And then once we are there, we look for the turtle and if it's not immediately visible, it's probably hiding and we make a location okay. estimate. Okay. So because we can't see this individual, he's probably underground, uh, we're going to do a location estimate point, which means it's not a visual, but we know he's here. Um, so we're going to collect soil temperature with a soil thermometer and add a point on our field maps app. 
and it's, we're going to collect um, the habitat data. So what type of vegetation is here, how exposed is the turtle, which is 0% because we can't even see him, um, and other habitat stuff. All right, we have a visual on our first turtle. This is a female that we had transmitted last year. So this is the second year she's been a part of this project. She seems so small to me. Can you talk about like ornates versus Easterns and then just box turtles in general? Sure. So ornate box turtles are generally smaller than the common Eastern box turtles. Um, the ornate box turtles also have these beautiful radiating lines, which is kind of how they get their name. Um, the Eastern box turtles tend to have more of like a sunburst sure. um, and more like concentrated yellow. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a female ornate box turtle and you can tell because she, her face is pretty like mottled, like her neck is kind of spotty mm -hmm. and her head is not solid green like a male's would be. Um, males also tend to have very bright forelegs, um, but you can't always go by color when right. you're sexing these individuals um, because we do have one female that is extraordinarily brightly colored. Um, another way to sex them is to look at their plastron. So she has a very flat plastron mm -hmm. and males tend to be more concave to make it easier to mount the females. Like they have a little dent almost. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. um, males also have a curved back toe, which she doesn't have, and she also has a very short tail. Um, males' tails tend to be thicker past, um, past the edge of their shell. Okay. She also has a lot of damage on her shell. Yeah, I noticed that. This is from attempted predation. So maybe a coyote or a raccoon got a hold of her and she holed up, she didn't lose any limbs, but her shell got damaged in the process. Um, but that just shows that her shell's working. It's doing what right. it's supposed yeah. to do. Uh, yeah, she seems fine, even though there's a little yeah, scrapes on it. Yeah, she's pretty active. <laughs> she's wanting to get away. So she's, she's doing well. Um, this female was uh, gravid with three eggs this year. Oh, wow, congratulations. <laughs> So yeah, but you can also see that she doesn't have an antenna on here, so it broke off and it makes tracking a little more difficult. But it's good that she has a small home range because we could get in the general right, area. Right, you can figure out that and she's then go somewhere from there. there. <laughs> so we disinfect our hands in between handling each individual just in case one individual has something wrong with it, like a disease or it's sick. Mm -hmm. We don't want to spread that to the next turtle. So from every time you monitor, how much do they move from place to place? Do you know kind of that they're in the same spot or are they just all over? Most of the time they don't move too far, which is why it's pretty easy to start at their last location and mm -hmm. find them pretty quickly. But you have a few turtles that will move quite a bit over Ooh. the weekend mm -hmm. or something like that. Take a weekend uh, vacation. Yeah, weekend getaway. And they'll just, <laughs> they'll just trek all the way across the prairie. Oh, wow. And we're like, um... It's not here, I have to go, I'll be back in 20 minutes just to track one turtle. So it really depends on the individual. So here we have a situation where it's a location estimate for this turtle because he is in a bucket. It is a piece of garbage that has been here for a very long time because it is mostly buried, but there's just enough space for him, him to get under there and hide and feel really safe and protected. Uh, this same turtle used the same bucket last year as well, so it's kind of his bucket. <laughs> All right, so just to give you a little perspective, a lot of these plants are as tall as, as us or taller, um, and a lot of these plants have big, sharp thorns. So that's been an adventure. And then if you look down on the ground, it's just an ocean of poison ivy. <laughs> so I give these techs a lot of props as they're just, I've already lost them, they're like disappeared in here, as they're searching for these turtles. When it's not thorny, it is really pretty to kind of take in the vista. Summer is always when prairies shine. So I've seen the first blooms of goldenrod. We've got all this nice purple. There's things mixed in. So it is a very peaceful and pretty day, just a little pokey one. <laughs> Tell us about this nesting structure. So this is an exclosure that we've put around an ornate box turtle nest. Um, this nest has seven eggs in it and we're hoping they hatch anywhere from like in a few weeks to in like a month or so. And this exclosure um, protects the nest from meso predators such as raccoons, possums, coyotes, anything like that that finds 
turtle eggs a delicacy. Delicious, yeah. <laughs> sure. And this is buried under, because I've read that raccoons can even dig under some of these. Yeah, this is several inches underground. There used to be um, this hardware cloth used to be around this as well to keep raccoon hands from even fitting through here. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to trap the hatchlings in here, so we removed that um, before the earliest hatch date is even anywhere near. So that allows them to just crawl out once they've uh, hatched. And how big are they gonna be? I just imagine these cute, adorable turtles. They're gonna be about the size of a quarter, so Yay! they'll fit through this very easily and they'll make for cover and we'll probably never see them. <laughs> and they're on their own after that, right? Like yep. mom doesn't come and take care of them. These turtles are totally self-sufficient once yep. they're born. Yep, she lays her eggs and then leaves them alone. So there's no like manual incubation. They let the sun do it and the mm -hmm. soil and um, I've got a camera on it hoping to catch the nest hatching, but I don't have high hopes for that. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for more footage if we get it. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> it took a lot of hours to find this female nesting because they nest at night, so we have to come out and track these females nightly whenever they are carrying eggs and hope that we catch them in the act of nesting. So we found a male this time, and I can already notice what you're talking about with the legs. They look much redder. Anything else you'd like to point out? Sure. So males tend to have more of a concave plaster on. It's not very obvious with him, but there's still enough of a dent here yeah. that the females lack. And you're saying his head's all green. Yeah. So males have this nice solid green head and then the more orange uh, forelegs. So then, yeah, this back claw, oh, yeah, I see, it. see how it's thicker and it's like really hooked? Mm -hmm. So they use that to mount the females and just kind of get a good, get a good grip. Hold. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> this turtle actually does have its antenna, which is wonderful. It makes tracking easier. Uh, this male travels far and wide, so him having the antenna is very important and helpful. Uh, because where we started out, we couldn't even pick up his signal with the antenna. So, uh, I'm worried about the day we lose this one. <laughs> but he Never travels all the way to the other end of the field and like basically once everybody emerges, he mates and runs. That was quite the adventure. I almost felt like I was back in time walking through like such tall grasses and a vast prairie. Uh, would you say it's a successful day with all the turtles we found? Yeah, we found everybody we were looking for, at least got location points for them, mm -hmm. and we were able to see a few and share a few with you guys. So yeah, that was that's a great day. Even just seeing the little shells pop out, like I was still very thrilled. I mean, I love seeing wild animals doing wild things, and that's what, exactly what those turtles should be doing. So even just seeing a little shell was a win in my book. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Monitoring wildlife is so important for the animals and figuring out their role in the ecosystem. Thank you, Becky, for letting us tag along. Her passion on what she does is contagious. I encourage you to investigate our other wildlife monitoring programs. And when the season's right, you can track bluebirds, frogs, dragonflies, and butterflies. All the data truly helps our wildlife ecologists make sure that the ecosystem is healthy. Do you want to do more to protect nature, inspire discovery, and connect people with the great outdoors? You can when you support the Nature Foundation of Will County. This nonprofit charity raises funds through support from donors, organizations, and the business community to help support the Forest Preserve District of Will County's mission. The foundation helps various initiatives take flight. It helps the forest preserve secure national touring exhibitions. It pays for new amenities such as campground welcome stations and bike repair stations on Will County's regional trails. It assists with the costs associated with land stewardship, which includes equipment for volunteer workdays and seeding of native plants to restore the land to its original state, which helps enhance not only your outdoor experiences, but local wildlife as well. There's a lot more work to be done, and we're just getting started.
Roll with us on this adventure and become a champion for nature so future generations can appreciate and explore everything Mother Nature has to offer. Donate today at willcountynature.org. For over a decade now, Moni Reservoir has hosted the Recycle Your Bicycle program, and throughout the years we've collected thousands of bikes. Now Hidden Oaks Nature Center is joining in the efforts and making an additional drop-off location. One of the biggest questions we get when hosting these drop-offs is where do the bikes go? Well today we're taking a road trip to find that out. These bikes don't go to the recycling center with our plastic water bottles, they go to Working Bikes in Chicago. Working Bikes gives these bicycles new life by redistributing them as tools of empowerment to local and global communities. They're working towards a world where everyone has access to a bicycle as a reliable, sustainable, and environmentally friendly transportation option, all while reducing waste, lessening pollution, and improving health in the process. Just last year, Working Bikes collected 10,000 bikes and countless bike parts from Chicago and around the Midwest. Of those 10,000 bikes, 6,800 of them were shipped in 15 containers to their partners in Africa and Central America. Working Bikes is located on Western Avenue in Chicago, about 40 miles north of us. So we're gonna hit the road today to tour the facility and find out exactly what happens to our donated bike. We're here at the Working Bikes facility and I'm just so thrilled to get out of our little bubble to see how far our reach is with this Recycle the Bicycle program, not only helping a neighboring community, but communities across the globe. So let's head inside. This is Trevor Clark, Executive Director of Working Bikes. He's gonna give us a tour. We're gonna meet some of the other staff and all of you guys are gonna answer all of our questions. So thank you for letting us peek inside your world today. Thank you guys so much for coming back out here. Yes, we toured a little bit with staff and I just had to come back and show the Buzz viewers everything about this because your mission is awesome, this business is awesome. That's so awesome. let's start with how long has Working Bikes been in operation? We're going into our 23rd year of operation. We started back in 1999 when Lee and Amy Ravenscroft, uh, Amy Little, Lee Ravenscroft, collected bikes at their home in Oak Park, got so many that they weren't able to process them, and packed that first container up and sent it down to Nicaragua. And from that point, one container, we now do between 15 and 17 containers a year and get thousands of bikes to people who need them around Chicago. So was there an aha moment to start collecting these bikes and has it changed the mission over time? I wasn't around in the very beginning of working bikes, but I think the aha moment still stands and, and that is seeing that there are all these resources around Chicago that aren't being put to good use. Um, back in the day it was like bikes on the scrap trucks that mm -hmm. go up and down the alley and they knew they were going to the scrap yard, they'd be melted down for pennies but saw at the same time other communities, Central America, Africa, where a bike has a ton of value and could be used as a resource. So trying to take what's waste in one place and turn it into a resource in another is kind of the aha moment that's held true for the last 23 years. There are a lot of people who are interested in turning what could be trash into something valuable. So whether it's folks like, um, Mm -hmm. uh, Will County Forest Preserve, who help collect bikes, bring them to us, volunteers like you see behind me here who are refurbishing the bikes, or the partners that we work with who help get them to people who really need the bikes as a tool of transportation. It takes a lot of people all along the road there to add value to these bikes to make sure that they're still used um, by people down the line. And I see lots of bikes almost everywhere here. Do you ever have too many bikes and you stop collecting? No, is, is the short answer. We have times where we get overwhelmed. The big picture, the need is so great with our partners in Africa and Central America. Um, we'd never want to stop bringing in bikes and getting them out to folks who need them. 
So the Forest Preserve District of Will County has participated in Recycle Your Bicycle, which is a drop-off that we collect bikes for you. And we've done it for maybe over a decade, 11, 12 years. Um, how has that helped you in working oh, bikes? It's been an amazing help to working bikes. So I think you all have collected over 2,000 bikes for us over the year. Um, and we couldn't do what we do without the support of groups like yours. So those bikes come into working bikes and then we try to figure out the best possible use for them. And up here, mm -hmm. uh, no small number of bikes from Will County have come here. This is really what sustains the organization. So internationally, um, we'll donate a bunch of bikes, two thirds of them that come into working bikes. But up here are bikes that we'll have professional mechanics fix and then we'll end up selling to bring some revenue into the shop to allow us to do all those other donations. And I know every year there's a, a good number that come from Will County, get put up here, and then we'll go out to um, folks who need them and buy them from working bikes. About 30% of the bikes that come to us will stay around Chicago. Half of those will get refurbished by professional mechanics and sold, and half of them will get fixed by volunteer mechanics and donated locally. Here we're going to refurbish, we're looking at maybe 1,500 bikes this year um, with all these amazing volunteers to get the bikes out to people who need them and might not be able to afford them otherwise. So Brandon's Bike Shop is a really great volunteer space. So it was named after a volunteer who sadly passed away a few years ago, but it was able to turn his love of bikes into this really great space, um, a really great teaching opportunity space. So. Uh, volunteers work on refurbishing old bicycles for our local donation program. So all the bikes you see volunteers working on are uh, intended for use of our local donation program. So um, we've got volunteers learning on mechanics. We've got seasoned volunteers who have been here for years who just love to share their love of mechanics with other volunteers. And everybody is here just learning and uh, growing their mechanic skills for uh, folks in the community all of the programming that we have is because production department. Here you're surrounded by amazing mechanics, professional mechanics who build up the bicycle so you can ride it safely, so they're rideable with a 30-day warranty. So we have mechanics stand in front of that bench for over four hours to build one bicycle. It means that they inspect the entire frame, they make sure that it's uh, worthy of building up, right? And then um, they check and overhaul and clean and inspect and grease up all of the four bearing systems and upgrade some of the components as needed. We'll accept referrals from basically anybody who works with a vulnerable population. So mm -hmm. we run a program called the Cycle of Power where bikes that our volunteers fixed up are donated to people who need a bike for transportation and couldn't afford it on their own. We'll get them a bike, a lock, a helmet, and a set of lights so that they can get wherever they need to go and have them come back to working bikes if any work needs to be done on that bike and we'll do it free or at cost. Uh, we find those people through our partners, right? Okay. So we work with a lot of caseworkers, social service agencies, refugee resettlement groups who identify people who need that bike for transportation fill out an online form with us, we'll add them to a wait list. In the winter, we can get you going real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. At this point in the year, it's about a four week wait list. Volunteers are working hard all the time to fix the bikes out, and then we'll get them out to people who need them. Most of the bikes behind me right now are gonna head on the shipping container, assuming it gets here, that will end up with our friends at TransAid in Madagascar. And this is a project that was supported by a group in the UK, some funding from the US government to build up a self-sustaining bike shop. We think of ourselves as providing the raw materials. So the, okay. the bikes that we ship, we don't work on. We know some of the bikes aren't perfect, they'll need work done. Uh, so along with the bikes, with all those little empty spaces in the container, we'll pack it full of used parts, additional tires, additional wheels, hopefully everything that our partners would need uh, to be able to have the one bike going and then also make additional repairs to it, fix other bikes that they have, try to give them all the supplies we can muster here.
What an inspiring trip to see how our bikes impact our neighbors and communities around the globe. If you're interested in working bikes, please look up their website and check out our Recycle Your Bicycle program. This year, we're gonna have two drop-offs, one at Moni Reservoir in Moni, and the other one at Hidden Oaks Nature Center in Bolingbrook. Bikes can be dropped off during preserve hours from September 17th through October 2nd. So what are you waiting for? Go clean out that garage and donate a bike to Working Bikes. The days are getting cooler, and it's the perfect time to get moving in the great outdoors with this year's Woods Walk Challenge. This self-paced hiking challenge means you can tackle it how you want to, when you want to. Go solo and use it to get some stress-free alone time, or bring a friend. The 10 trails have something for everyone. From cool tree canopies, colorful native plants, and wide open views, you're sure to see plenty of cool things along the way. Pick up a hiking guide at any of our visitor centers, then hit the trails. Turn in your travel log after completing seven or more of the hikes to receive your collector's medal. So hop to it and start exploring. Map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org. We've covered so much ground on this episode, from roaming around in the prairie looking for turtles, to going into the city to tour the Working Bikes facility. We hope this inspires you to help your natural community by volunteering with wildlife monitoring, or help the human community by donating a bike. Make sure to check out our website at reconnectwithnature.org for volunteering opportunities and to check out our Recycle Your Bicycle program. I hope to see you at a bike drop-off, but until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.